Hey, it's Alan, and I just wanted to let you know that you can now listen to the ongoing history of new music early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Creating art is hard. If it wasn't, everyone would do it, and everyone would be successful at doing it. Even those who can create art, the people with the right stuff, seem to have a finite supply of good stuff within them. Take Margaret Mitchell, for example. She wrote exactly one novel. But that novel was gone with the wind. Pulitzer Prize, a classic movie with multiple Academy Awards, 30 million copies sold, endless adaptations. It even got her face on a stamp. So in short, Gone with the Wind, first published in 1937, was and still is a cultural phenomenon. But that's all she ever did. Old Marge hit it out of the park on the first pitch, and that was it. One novel. And she is perhaps the greatest literary one-hit wonder of all time. Why? Well, maybe that's all she had in the tank. Or maybe she just looked at all the success she got from that one novel and said, right, my work is done here. Anything else I do will just be a letdown. I'm stopping while I'm way ahead. Totally get that. Other artists, though, keep trying after that one hits. But for whatever reason... The magical pixie dust that they managed to harness that one time disappears forever. Man, to get a taste of standing on the mountaintop only to be denied it ever again? But, and let's be very clear about this, at least they made it to the top of that mountain, even if it was just once. And if they're lucky, that one trip can sustain them for the rest of their careers, the rest of their lives. Here's another program featuring those who got to the top just once. It's great alt-rock one-hit wonders of the 90s, part two. This is the Ongoing History of New Music podcast with Alan Cross. Before we begin, I want you to listen to this. I know it's familiar. That's Canon in D, composed by Johann Pachelbel, sometime between 1680 and 1706. And although he composed lots and lots and lots of music during his lifetime, that was his only hit. Unless you're really into classical music, you probably can't name another thing he did. Okay, bonus points to anyone who's now screaming, Chocon in F minor. Okay, no prize, but uh, you know, you win this round. There's a whole subset of classical music fans devoted to these kinds of one-hit wonders. They'll bring up names like Jeremiah Clark, Samuel Barner, and Thomas Albinoni. Every genre has their one-hit wonder. Jazz, R&B, country, pop. And for this show, we're going to look at more one-hitters from the world of alt-rock. Hello again, I'm Alan Cross. And again, let's set the table. In 1991, Nirvana's Nevermind comes out and starts selling 300,000 copies a week. Pearl Jam, Soundgarden, Smashing Pumpkins, Stone Temple Pilots, Chili Peppers, and dozens and dozens of other formerly fringe acts started selling records and concert tickets by the boatload. Generation X, the generation driving the culture at the time, had an insatiable appetite for this kind of music. So the herd mentality took over. Instructions went out to all the talent scouts at the record labels. If it sounds alternative and halfway decent, sign it. So they did. And for a while, it was pretty awesome. So many great bands waiting to be discovered. But there were some misses along the way. And some of those signings only had one good song. But that didn't matter because if the song was a big enough hit, people would go out and buy the CD at $15 or $20 or whatever for that one song, regardless if the rest of the album wasn't very good. Or maybe the other songs were good. One or two of them. But for whatever reason, the label bailed on promoting any singles after that one initial hit. Maybe they had no faith in the band, or maybe they made a decision to cut and run. The artist was left behind with their one hit. Maybe the musical mood had changed, and their material was no longer capturing any kind of cultural zeitgeist. There are lots of explanations. We are going to examine some of these situations. And the first song comes from Dishwalla. Dishwalla came out of Santa Barbara, California in 1993, and they were caught up in the major label stampede to sign everyone and anything alternative sounding. In 1995, they released a major label debut called Pet Your Friends. Huge record out of the gate, selling more than half a million copies in the U.S. 
There was a second record on the same label three years later, but nobody cared. Since then, Dishwala has endured a breakup and has released a series of indie records. But they've never, ever been able to repeat the success of a single from early 1996. Not only was it an alternative hit, but it made it all the way to number 15 on the Billboard Hot 100 singles chart. So yeah, this was a top 40 hit. We said, tell me. Dishwalla with their one and only hit, Counting Blue Cars from 1996. By the way, do you know what a Dishwalla is? It's a Hindi term for the person who comes to your neighborhood in India with satellite TV service. They install a dish. Next is Hum. They've been around in one form or another, not counting various breaks, since 1989. They started releasing music on an indie label in 1991, but by 1995, they had a major label deal with RCA which resulted in You'd Prefer an Astronaut. That's actually their third album. The first single was called Stars. Big alt-rock radio hit. Lots of exposure. Close to half a million records sold. But after that, nada. A couple of other singles from the album stiffed, and after a second record for RCA, they were dropped and have been working as an indie band ever since. However, that one song and that album have been cited as extremely influential. The Deftones, for example, say that You'd Prefer an Astronaut was a big deal to them and how they developed their sound. Admirers also include the Smashing Pumpkins and Sonic Youth and a slew of other heavy fuzzy bands. If you need a refresher, here's the hit. From Champaign, Illinois, that's Hum with Stars, their one alt-rock hit. There are plenty of good songs besides that, but none of them did that well. Still, they made some good money from the song, especially when it showed up in a commercial for Cadillac. And in 2020, they got back together again and released a record called Inlet, first album in 22 years. I'll get some flack from British music fans by including Corner Shop on this list of alt-rock wonders. And while they have remained a thing outside of North America, the band is still together, their only major alt-rock radio hits anywhere has been brimful of Asha from 1997. Corner Shop's head guy is Tajinder Singh, and the story is that this song took two months and several pounds of pot to complete. The engineer assigned to the sessions smoked so much dope and got so freaked out that he actually needed medical assistance. The track was included on the group's third album, When I Was Born for the Seventh Time, and the Asha in the song is a reference to Asha Bosley, who was Bollywood's most famous playback singer. Now, Bollywood films are famous for their big singing and dancing scenes. The conceit is that the stars of these movies do their own singing. Well, no, playback singers are often used, and anything that we see on film is just lip syncing. Asha is said to have performed more than 12,000 songs for Indian films. When the song was first released, something was missing. Here's a taste of that first version. After listening to it a bunch of times, someone at the record label said, you know, I know what's wrong. It's just a touch too slow. There were two ways to fix that. They could go back into the studio and re-record it, but that would require more time and more dope, or they could just pitch it up just a little bit. The label hired Fatboy Slim, and his remix consisted of nothing more than increasing the speed of the master tape. So instead of being in the key of A, he bumped it up ever so slightly that it landed somewhere between a B-flat and a B. And that did it. It gave it just the right amount of energy and turned the song into a hit. So let's compare. Here's that original again. And now here's the hit version. Same recording, slightly different speed. Good band, Corner Shop, but in most of the world, that is their only hits. When we come back, more bands who had just one great song and nothing more. This is part two of our look at some awesome alt-rock one-hit wonders from the 1990s. Again, we are not passing any kind of negative judgment on any of these artists or any of these songs. 
we are simply acknowledging that because of a variety of circumstances, these groups managed just one hit. Not just one good song, but one hit. And that is better than nothing. This brings us to Kay's Choice, a group from Antwerp, Belgium, who broke through in the middle 1990s with one, and again, only one song. The debut album was called The Great Subconscious Club. That was released in 1994. And this was a bit confusing because Kay's Choice was known as just The Choice at the time. That had to be changed to Kay's Choice at the very last second because an American band had dibs on the name. If you really want to go down a rabbit hole, let me just tell you this. They used to claim that the K stands for Joseph K, the main character in the novel The Trial by Franz Kafka. If you want to go in that direction, be my guest. And then forget what you learned, because that was just a cover for the fact that the band thought that K's choice just sounded good. They made the switch just as the album was released. Four singles were taken from the record to not much acclaim. Then came Paradise and Me, another record, which featured a song called Not an Addict. And this one blew up, reaching the top 40 in a bunch of countries. It also became an alt-rock hit in North America, which landed them on a tour with Alanis Morissette, who was at her peak with the Jagged Little Pill album. There were more albums, followed by a breakup in 2003, but then there was a reunion in 2009 and more albums. However, they have never, ever been able to equal the success of this song. Now, before I play it, Note that the singer's name is Sarah Bettens. Okay, hold that thought. Kay's Choice from 1996 with Not an Addict. Like I said, the singer is Sarah Bettens. And she amassed a large lesbian following in the heyday of Kay's Choice before moving to Tennessee, where she became a firefighter. Then, in 2019, Sarah transitioned to a man and now goes by the name Sam Bettens. He now lives in Palm Desert, California with his partner, two stepchildren, and two adopted kids. Here's another example of a band that was swept up very, very early in the rush to sign alt-rock bands in the early 90s. School of Fish was formed in Los Angeles in 1990, and had a debut album in stores by April 1991. Bit early for the whole alt-rock thing, but hang on. When you think back to what was hot back then, a grinding sort of guitar style, later made famous by groups like the Smashing Pumpkins, School of Fish should have been leaders in this space, but I think they were about a year ahead of their time. When their self-titled debut album came out, Nirvana, Pearl Jam, the Smashing Pumpkins, and Soundgarden had yet to release their defining albums. The alt-rock scene had yet to coalesce into the monster it became in the 90s. Still, this song was an alt-rock radio hit, but it was the only thing of note to ever come out of School of Fish. This is their one-hit wonder from the spring of 1991. It's called Three Strange Days. Great song, but ahead of its time released just a few too many months before the word grunge really entered our vocabulary. That's School of Fish and Three Strange Days. Had they been able to follow that up with another single, or if their second album had been better received, we still might be talking about them as alt-rock stars of the 90s. But alas, no, the second album flopped. Maybe it was the big lineup shuffle. Maybe it was the fact that the second record featured session musicians. But whatever, the band broke up with everybody going their separate ways. One member went on to play with The Wallflowers and Ben Harper. Another wrote the theme song for the TV show Scrubs. And singer Josh Clayton Feltz went solo before dying of a very aggressive sort of testicular cancer in 1999. Here's another alt-rock one-hit wonder whose singer came to a tragic end. The group was Sparkle Horse, and they were led by a very well-regarded songwriter from Richmond, Virginia, named Mark Linkhouse. He had fans in The Flaming Lips and Metric and The Silver Sun Pickups and Patti Smith and many others. In 1996, Sparkle Horse released a record called Viva Dixie Submarine Transmission Plot. It featured the band's one and only alt-rock hits. Let me play that for you, and then I'll tell you what happened to Mark. This is called Someday I Will Treat You Good. Sparkle Horse with their one-hit wonder, Someday I Will Treat You Good. Their debut album was enough to land them on a European tour with Radiohead. 
But this is when things went very, very wrong. Leader Mark Linkhouse OD'd. Antidepressants, Valium, and heroin, all washed down with a lot of alcohol. He ended up passing out in the bathroom of his London hotel room with his legs pinned underneath him, and he was in that position for 14 hours before he was found. When he was rescued, a buildup of potassium caused his heart to stop. He was revived and then rushed into surgery. But then he lost the use of both legs for six months, forcing him to use a wheelchair. And if that wasn't bad enough, he suffered kidney failure and required dialysis for the rest of his life. This affected his outlook in his songwriting, which became darker and more somber. He continued to work, writing music for both Sparkle Horse and for various TV and film projects, but his depression lingered. Then, while in the process of a divorce from his wife of 19 years, he took a rifle, went for a walk, sat down in an alley in Knoxville, Tennessee, aimed the gun at his heart, and pulled the trigger. At the time, he had a blood alcohol level of 0.43. Various antidepressants and anti-anxiety medications were found in his system. One more alt-rock one-hit wonder from the 90s, and it's uh, kind of a strange one. Hang tight. We have time for one more alt-rock one-hit wonder from the 90s, and it's the story of primitive radio gods. They evolved out of a Southern California band called the I-Rails, a group that amounted to exactly nothing over four albums between 1985 and 1991. The band broke up, and singer Chris O'Connor went out on his own, recording some Public Enemy-inspired material under the name Primitive Radio Gods. He floated these demos to radio in the music industry, but got nothing. So that was it. O'Connor decided that it was time to retire from music and find something that would actually pay. In 1994, Chris was cleaning up around the house and found this box of demos. What the hell, he thought and mailed cassettes to all the major labels he could think of. It was a total desperation move. And nothing. Until many weeks later, when he got a call from Fiction Records. They had liked this track called Standing Outside a Broken Phone Booth with Money in My Hand. It was a piano track featuring a sampled B.B. King singing a song called How Blue Can You Get? This kind of sample-based music was getting traction at the time, so Fiction signed him to a deal. The sound first appeared on the soundtrack of the Jim Carrey movie Cable Guy. It tested well with audiences, so an album was commissioned. It was called Rocket, and thanks to this phone booth song, the album went on to sell half a million copies. Primitive Radio Gods with Standing Outside a Broken Phone Booth with Money in My Hand from 1996. When the song took off, singer Chris O'Connor got his old mates in the eye rails back together and went on tour. Then an error. The label decided that the follow-up single was going to be a track called Mother Effer. Yeah, not, uh, not a lot of promotion or radio airplay for a song with a title like that. And because nothing happened, surprise, they were dropped by their label. However, they carried on and continue to carry on. There are six Primitive Radio Gods albums, an EP, three compilation records, and even a DVD. Hey, lightning struck once, right? Maybe it'll strike again. Here's a question. Given the choice of being a one-hit wonder or having no hits at all, which would you choose? Well, for me, it's a no-brainer. Even one hit song could bring in a steady source of income for years or even decades. Better be known for one thing than nothing at all, right? Okay, yeah, there's a certain stigma attached to anyone who has managed to have that one big song, but let me ask you this. How many hits have you had? Yeah, I thought so. We'll have to revisit this topic again in the future. People love stories of one-hit wonders. And if you have any suggestions, let me know about it. I can be found at alan at alancross.ca. I'm also on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Plus, there's my website, a ajournalofmusicalthings.com. Get the free newsletter so you don't miss any updates. And remember, all these programs are always available as podcasts. Spotify, Apple Music, Stitcher, all the platforms. Share, rate, and review if you get a chance. That's always appreciated. Tactical Productions by Rob Johnston. We'll talk to you next time. I'm Alan Cross. You've been listening to the Ongoing History of New Music podcast with Alan Cross. Subscribe to the podcast through iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, and everywhere you find your favorite podcasts. (laughs) 